Hi, everybody. On this blustery Wednesday, uh, it is November 15th. Good gracious. Uh, the year flew by heading into the turn at Thanksgiving. Uh, before we get to the prayer request, just a, a quick announcement. Uh, I did put it in your email invites, but I will not be having a breaking bread over the Thanksgiving holidays. We will resume before uh, Christmas, but the 22nd and the 29th, we will be taking off the 22nd, 29th, put it on your calendars. I know you guys are going to log in anyway, because I see it show up on my laptop and it makes me smile. Thank you for your faithfulness, <laughs> but uh, nobody will be joining you. So it'll be a very lonely login. And uh, uh, Paul is here with us. I recognize his chuckle and now see his face. We do have uh, some prayer requests. Some of them are urgent and very serious. So if you guys could jot these down and give it some fervent prayer today and in the days to come. Um, we just talked to Dana, obviously, his grandson, Mark. They're concerned that this uh, uh, problem with his leg that's uh, painful for him, uh, there is a concern about it being cancer. So... We do want to pray. Uh, they don't have answers on this yet. We All they have are questions and worries and concerns. You can imagine as the parents of a 10-year-old how um, concerning that would be. So if you guys could keep little Mark in prayer, uh, that it would not, in fact, be cancer, and it would be something relatively easy, uh, easy and simple to fix. Um, Jim and Rachel are traveling uh, to North Carolina and other places so you just pray for their safe return i guess in my screen she's upper right but you see donna is back with us she had a great trip out to see her sister and cared and ministered to her and thank you lord that you got donna back to us safely Amen. um Yay. we need to continue to pray over israel and yeah. the events that are happening there and just the general um, shift in support that seems to be happening. Unfortunately, even in this country, uh, I was encouraged to see that uh, march in support yesterday in Washington, D.C. for Israel. That was a wonderful thing. Uh, but we need to continue to pray for the peace of Israel, for their protection. Uh, so just please keep lifting them up. Um, Steve, I'm going to put you on the spot. Did uh, Mary end up having her kidney operation, your sister? I believe not because she hasn't contacted me about that. All right. Will you please keep us in the loop on that one? I sure will. Thank you. All right. And then probably my, uh, oh, hey, Jim. <laughs> he may not have audio. Uh, I don't know if he can hear me or not. Um Probably the most serious uh, one that I want you to pray about is one we've had on our list for a few weeks now, Linda's brother, Patrick, who has a very significant battle going on with throat cancer. Mm. Uh, he's now missed his fourth uh, chemotherapy session due to just the side effects and the illness associated with this. So if you guys could please, please, this is the urgent one. This is the one that's a very time sensitive. If you could please pray for Linda's brother, Patrick, for God to heal him. Uh, it doesn't matter to me whether God chooses uh, chemotherapy, radiation, or none of the above, just a miracle from above. But we just pray for uh, Patrick. And please, that's something you'll need to continue to do this week, if, if you would, please. Um, <clears throat> All right, so with that, um, I am going to ask you to turn to John chapter 6. And before we get rolling, I'll, uh, Bill, if you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself, it's a pleasure to have you back. I know Bill always um, kind of, it sounds creepy, but Bill always watches you guys online. It's not meant to be creepy, Bill. Oh, that's um, creepy. <laughs> so, so he has stayed in touch with us through YouTube, but it's good to have him back live and, and uh, in person. So, Bill, would you mind opening us up in prayer 
this morning before we get started, this afternoon, sorry. Thank you. Dear Lord, we're here together studying your word uh, as brothers. And I thank you very much for the inspiration that you have given us and given us our leader, Lynn, and Rick and Red for all these years. Uh, John is a very special gospel. Uh, you teach us so much to us about whom you are, your love for us, Jesus. And every lesson, we learn something new. We've all read John before, yet every lesson, you're teaching us something new. And I thank you for that. Lord, I do pray for peace in Israel. Uh, I do want to mention also peace for the Palestinian people, peace for our country. Uh, we're divided. Uh, please don't let us be divided. Let us be one in you, Lord Jesus. Uh, thank you for your grace. And again, thank you for the lesson for today. Amen. Thank you, guys. Amen. I got to retrain some of you since we have Donna, Linda, uh, and Shuggy yeah. on here that it's brothers and sisters. You guys are hard to retrain. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So go with me to the Gospel of John, chapter six. We're going to start in verse 30. We're probably going to get through about verse 50, and then when we resume after the break, we will finish chapter 6. Uh, I think it's important as we break up a chapter into multiple weeks that you have some context, like who, where are we, what are we doing, who is there, that kind of thing. So go ahead and put yourselves on mute, and we will take away the study. And first, I'll kind of give you a recap. Um, Let's see. Let me let Jim in. Hold on one second. Hopefully he can get his audio going this time. All right. Uh, so first of all, where we are at, Jesus has just healed the 5,000. The crowd kind of rushes. It's one of the greatest miracles in the New Testament. The crowd kind of rushes on him, wants to make him he king. Did. He, did. He, he, was he, 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 did. he removes himself from the situation, goes up to the Golan Heights and, and sends his disciples away on the boat. Uh, the storm kicks up. He walks on the water. We've already covered all this. They instantly get transported, teleported, whatever Star Trek terminology you want to use, over to the other side at Capernaum, where they were headed. And it's where this is whole um, interaction between Jesus and the crowd is now taking place last week, this week, and when we conclude, and several weeks from now, uh, when we conclude chapter six. And this dialogue, as I mentioned to you at, by way of summary, um, we have hit peak Jesus, okay? That was at the feeding of the 5,000. And I've given you some foreshadowing that chapter six, things take a really bad, ugly turn for Jesus in terms of his popularity. Now, that wasn't his mission. His mission was never to win a popularity contest, but clearly you're gonna see a shift in the crowd today. And it takes a worse turn when we complete chapter six in a couple of weeks. Um, who is who is there? So we have the, the locals, uh, uh, the Capernaum locals, and they're attending the synagogue. It's the Sabbath. This is what they do. You also have the thousands that of pilgrims that were making their way to Jerusalem to observe um, Passover, but they got sidetracked by this feeding of the 5,000. Now this is all they can think about is where can we get more free bread? So either by boat or by shore, they've also come over to Capernaum seeking Jesus, trying to find him. And now there's a third group in the mix. And this is, you'll notice the reference to the Jews. Now, they were all Jewish. So what does this mean? The Jews in the Gospel of John simply means he's referring to the Jewish leadership. So the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the elders of the Jewish church who came in from Jerusalem, some of them were there at Capernaum, at the synagogue, on this Sabbath, in the crowd. And you're going to see the influence that they have on the crowd today. So 
That's your context. That's where we are. Now, before I read today, I need to give you just the, the cliff note version because this is going to be confusing when I read it. The explanation will make it crystal clear, but if I don't tell you the big picture first before we read it, you're going to be scratching your head. Jesus tries to explain to them in very metaphorical terms that what they seek is bread for the body, but what he offers is bread for, for the eternal soul. He offers them eternal life. He tells them he is from God. He tells them he is the son of God. He tells them he is from heaven. And as this goes on, you can clearly see not only does the crowd not get it, and it isn't because they're dense, it's because they don't want to get it. Um, but you'll also see him become less ambiguous and just start stating things. We saw him do this with, uh, with Nicodemus, too, if you remember. He starts out using this metaphorical language, and when it's clear that they're just not getting it, he has to just come right out, John 3.16, and tell Nicodemus the straight scoop. You're going to see this happen again today, but unlike Nicodemus, um, they don't like what the straight scoop is. As a matter of fact, you'll see in a few weeks that he has a mass exodus of followers, including some of his disciples, some of his own inner circle. So this is the context of what we're reading today is how this comes about, how this develops. Now, the reason it's important that we cover this, Lynn, you just gave us the whole lesson. Why do we need to listen to the next 40 minutes of you rambling on? Because there's some great um, theological principles that are divulged in here. And it's also important, as Marty pointed out, uh, probably a month or so ago is why did, you know, this is such a great offer. Why doesn't everybody respond to it positively? And you'll get a, a little bit of a taste as to why. So the people are all, they're all in the synagogue, this huge mishmash of three groups. And therefore they said to Jesus, they said to him in verse 30, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you, what work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So stop for a minute. I don't know how that comes off to you, but that looks like a, a, a very disrespectful challenge. I wrote the words, prove it all over my notes. Like it's a bunch of fifth graders. On, in a schoolyard, prove it, prove it. And do they know who they're talking to? Apparently not the way they're addressing him. So Jesus said to them, after they said this to him, most assuredly, remember when he says that, he's drawing attention to what he's going to say next. Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So the first thing the crowd does when Jesus from last week is talking about the bread and I'm giving you eternal bread and all you're focused on is material bread. So you can see the Jewish leaders have had a sway in the crowd. In essence, they're demanding that Jesus prove what he is saying to be true. Prove it. Do it again. We weren't there. This, these few thousand people said you did, but we weren't there. And we're the leadership. We want to see you do it. Perform right now. Snap. Come on. And, and, and this brings me to your first application, your first lesson. Listen to me, the created never has a place making demands of the creator. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you guys that as you read this, you're going to think, how stupid could they be? How, how arrogant could they be? How offensive could they be? And yet, we, they as us, as I can repeatedly tell you, they as us, whenever we get mad at God and shake our fist at him, 
whenever we try to bargain with God is if we've got anything to offer the creator of all things. Um, th th when, whenever we make demands on God, like uh, this isn't so much a problem anymore, but 30, 40 years ago, the name it and claim it, this, this where we, where God has to do something because I've done X. The created never has a place where they can make demands to the creator. You've got that completely backwards. So moving on, they, they kind of taunt Jesus with scripture. They say they're referring to an incident um, that happened in Exodus where um, Moses, God uses Moses to call down manna from heaven and he fed them while they wandered in the wilderness. And they said, our father ate, ate manna in the wilderness. They're, they're trying to manipulate him or force his hand into providing more bread for them to do a miracle when they snap their fingers. Just like Israel had manna provided for them when they wandered in the wilderness, they wanted, they wanted bread right now. And they even quoted scripture. What they quoted there was Psalm 105, 40. Um, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So they're even using scripture, by the way, which is because somebody uses scripture, even the devil uses scripture. Just because somebody uses scripture doesn't mean that that's biblical what they're doing. They, they're pulling it out of context and they're manipulating it to their own designs. So there is a tradition in Jewish culture that said that when the Messiah came, he would provide manna from heaven as Moses did. Now, I'm going to tell you something. That's nowhere in the Hebrew Bible. That is a tradition. It is not scriptural. It is in error. And yet it pervaded even the religious rulers thinkings that this was going to be one of the signs of the Messiah. So what they're doing, in essence, is they're challenging Jesus to be even greater than Moses. And they implied that Moses called down manna from heaven and did it every day. You did it once. Show us again. Now, by the way, they were wrong on point two. First of all, there is no scriptural basis for saying the Messiah would replicate Moses's actions of creating manna from heaven. So that was error number one. Error number two is Moses never did do anything. It was God who did it through Moses. But they're elevating Moses and saying, You're, you got to be greater than Moses. And they're challenging him. And, and, and one of the scholars said, Moses did it according to the way they thought. Moses did it repeatedly every day for 40 years. Jesus did it one time. Moses did it out of nothing. Jesus had to start with bread, so it's not as great of a miracle. He had to multiply something that already existed. So do you understand that the, the, the arrogance and contempt that they're talking to Jesus? And I just want you to notice how calm Jesus is speaking to them. He ignores the challenge. He ignores their slights. And he continues, and he's going to continue all throughout ch chapter 6, to talk about the bread of life, the bread of life, the, the bread that leads to eternal life. And he's going to stay on it because that is the reason he came. He said, my father gives you the true bread from heaven. And I can't, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he's gesturing to himself at this point. You might paraphrase what Jesus said like this. What other work do you want me to do? This, this is the work to give you the word of God and eternal life in and through me. This is the spiritual bread you have to feast on to have life. So he continues, just continues to beat them with the same message, not taking offense to what they're saying, trying to get through to them. He said, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven. He is trying to, to lift their gaze from earthly things like physical bread that only sustains the physical body. And he's trying to lift them on to 
heavenly realities to understand that he, the one standing before them, is the bread that is necessary for spiritual life, just as regular bread is necessary for physical life. I am the bread, he says. I am the bread which came down from heaven and gives life. He was showing them there's superiority and importance to what I'm talking about versus the physical bread that you're talking about. By the way, the manna that came down didn't give life. They were already alive. It only sustained life. So in that way, it was actually inferior to what Jesus is offering. And it was never intended for the whole world. It was only provided for the nation of Israel. The true bread of life that comes down from heaven gives life to all humanity, not just one nation, but to the entire world, if they will just come to him. All right, move on, 34 through 40. Hi, Jim and Rachel. Hopefully you can hear me now. Okay, they can. Good. 34 through 40. Then, so that here's their reply to what he just said. He just dropped some major bombs on them, theological bombs. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Hallelujah. They get it. They understand. Now they're talking. Nope. You're going to see in a minute, they're still talking about physical bread. They, they're thinking he's saying, oh, so you're not only just going to give us this bread the one time, you're going to give us bread forever, and we don't ever have to work, and we can just kick back and relax. Give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, he understands they're just not getting it. He tries to redirect again. I am the bread of life. What I'm talking about is me. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. That reminds you of the woman at the well, doesn't it? But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. That has to be the most disappointing words um, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this, this is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up on the last day. And this is the will he repeats, who sent me that everyone, listen to me, this is the gospel right here. Everyone who sees the son and believes in him may have everlasting life and I will raise him up on the last day. It absolutely kills me that people make these ridiculous claims that Jesus never claimed to be from heaven. Jesus never claimed to be God. Jesus was just a good prophet, a good teacher, a good person, a good scholar. Uh, but, and, and the Christians have twisted and manipulated all this into making him say stuff he never said. And good Lord, can they not read? This is in black and white out of Jesus's own words. So these people said, oh, good, give us the spread always. They've traveled across or around the Sea of Galilee to find and meet Jesus so he could fulfill the material needs miraculously. So they'll never have to work again. And they wanted it always. Now, again, before we knock them, they just make this statement after Jesus talks about something being far more important than physical bread, spiritual bread. Here it is. I'm standing in front of you. Believe in me. Have eternal life. And they're right back to the bread. But it's the same way, guys. Next application. It's the same way with almost all of our physical difficulties that we find ourselves in. We want Jesus to meet our physical needs. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Are you hearing me clearly? I didn't say there's anything wrong to pray for your physical needs, but it can never stop there. We frequently bring to him our physical needs, money, health, 
what relationships, and we completely neglect our need for spiritual things. So just as Jesus tried to lift the crowd's understanding off physical bread onto spiritual things, so too do we need our minds lifted. Going to church, praying, listening to breaking bread, studying your Bible. These are all mechanisms. By What are we trying to do here? Get, just be a brainiac? No. We're trying to, to, to emphasize spiritual things and de-emphasize physical things. We need to be able to think um, big picture. Remember, Jesus said, I know you have these needs. I already know you have them. It's not saying don't pray about them, but he's saying you need to prioritize the things that you pray about. What's really important. Don't just pray for physical things. Pray for your spiritual needs as well. I like what F.F. F. Bruce wrote at this point in the scriptures. His commentary was simply this. What they wanted he would not give. And what he offered, they would not receive. And sadly, that's going to be the commentary for a lot of people who hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's going to be the commentary for this crowd. And it's even going to be the commentary for some of his disciples. So Jesus responds, I am the bread of life. This is the first, I told you at the introduction to John, John emphasizes a bunch of these I am statements, okay? I would tell you it's E-G-O, new word, E-I-M-E. I -E. I don't, I'm not a Greek scholar, so don't know how to pronounce that. But that word is the same one that God refers to himself as when, when Moses is saying, who shall I say sent me? And God says, uh, he identifies himself as I am, all right? So, so. Jesus very specifically, very particularly uses these I am sayings. John records them for us in his gospel. It is a way to communicate to his listeners. It's kind of lost on us in our culture, but to his listeners, it is a way of proclaiming Jesus as saying, I'm God. So these are very important I am sayings. I am the bread of life. Um, since the audience continues to miss the point that Jesus is talking about spiritual things and not physical things. Um, he, he said, listen, I'm spelling it out for you now. I, you know this bread that I'm talking about metaphorically? No more metaphors. I am the bread of life. I'm the one. I'm what I'm talking about. And he says, he who comes to me shall never hunger. The one that comes to him. Now, let me explain comes to him or receive him. It means to, 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 to seek after, to receive him, to believe upon him. He says that person, that individual will find his spiritual hunger completely satisfied in me. I am the spiritual bread necessary for eternal life. And this, this verse here, it actually constitutes an appeal on the part of Jesus. He's not trashing them. He's appealing to them, to, to inviting them to come to me, to believe on me. I am the bread of life. And I like what Spurgeon wrote about this simple act of coming to Jesus. And I'll read you the exact quote. Spurgeon, I quote a lot on these weekly teachings. He's got some great lines. He said, faith in Christ is simply and truly described as coming to him. It's not a religion. It's not an acrobatic feat. It is simply coming to Christ. It's not an exercise of profound mental faculties. It is simply coming to Christ. As a child simply comes to its mother, as a blind man simply goes to his home, even an animal simply goes to its master. So too, coming to Christ is a very simple action indeed, yet it is all that is needed for eternal life. Charles Spurgeon, love that. 
Jesus now goes on. We're going to get in deep theological waters now. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Jesus made it clear that coming to him begins with the work of the Father. The Father has to, you'll see in a minute, draw them. It begins with the Father. People come to him, um, and Jesus will freely receive any and all that come to him. Now, in this passage, for you Bible nerds, this is um, two opposing viewpoints that has split the church over the years in one sentence. This is election and free will in one sentence. And the Bible clearly states both are true. And yet, how can they both be true when they say the opposite things? Election states that God chooses those who we will save. Free will says man chooses God. It's up to who chooses what. A Calvinist, five-point Calvinist, will say God does the choosing, period, end of story. An Arminianist will say it is the free will of man who does the, who does the choosing. And the Bible says both are true. How can they both be true? This, this sentence says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. The action is clearly on the Father's part. But yet the next phrase says, and the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. So the second phrase puts all the action on us, the recipient. Which one is true? Is the Bible a lie? Does it seemingly contradicts itself? So throughout our ages, the church has drawn these sharp divisions, these sharp lines, and complete denominations, which I won't mention, have lined up on both sides of this and staked their flag in a ridiculous supposition that we can completely understand what this is talking about. And they both have great, oh, well, this is what it says here, and this is what it, and and they completely try to discount all the other person's verses. And the Arminianist says, oh, no, here's my verses and discounts the Calvinist verses. And the point of fact is, guys, we don't know the answer to this. So please do not draw dividing lines within the church over something that we don't fully comprehend. Am I clear on that? Because some of you guys belong to one camp. Some of you guys belong to the other camp and you, you, you live and die by this principle. And it's ridiculous because the Bible says both are true. Now, Lynn, does that mean the Bible contradicts itself and it's an illogical document? No, it does not. It means we have a limited mind and we can't completely comprehend everything that God says is true any more than an ant can comprehend how a cell phone device works. Uh, and, and by the way, that, that uh, gulf between the ant and the cell phone operation is probably much greater in our case versus God. I will tell you for those who want to do a deep dive on this, and then we have to go to break. Um, there was a um, Jesuit priest by the name of Luis Molina. He lived in the 1500s. Uh, he was a Catholic um, theologian. He was also a very controversial figure. They were going to kill him, actually. But eventually the Pope weighed in his favor and his life was spared. But he came up with something, um, a theological concept that seeks to reconcile God's election with man's free will. It's called God's middle knowledge. Anybody that wants to do a deep dive in that, good luck. You'll spend the next couple of years trying to understand it. Uh, it is commonly known in in honor of him, Molinism, from, from uh, Luis Molina, Molinism. So Molinism is a way to view these two concepts to a human being's limited mind to where they make sense, even though they appear to oppose one another. So with that heavy theological bombshell drop, we will go to break. And when we come back, we'll hopefully be on time today and get this done. And you'll all be out here by 1.15 sign back on in the next minute or so.